Greetings environmentalists for lecture 18 on humans and climate change. If we're at 18, that means we only have two more to go. Yay! Let's get started. Today we are going to be learning about how humans and climate change relate, but maybe not in the way you expect. Expected. We're going to analyze the impact on climate on humans, not vice versa. We'll look at that humans on climate change issue for the last two lectures. Compare and contrast different humans around the planet because there are various different species. Evaluate survival strategies of humans in response to climate change from some of our ancient ancestors. And we're critically going to evaluate the current status of climate change and the human element. For the last three lectures, we gotta have some disclaimers. They're just the obvious controversial issues that need addressing before we get into it. And this one in particular, this lecture can uh, kind of raise the hair on some of your back of your necks and kind of stir up a pot inside of your soul. So let's get to why. And my disclaimer is this. This will probably be the most controversial of all the lectures you watch this semester, and I am quite aware that the topics we are fixing to discuss have many different cultural, social, political, academic, and probably even especially religious traditions associated with them. The intent of this lecture is simply to introduce you to some of the biggest topics facing science today. It is in no way designed to make you feel uncomfortable. Recognize that part of science is looking at all the elements in terms of all sides of the story. So that's what we're trying to achieve here. So as part of our grand finale of our course or courses, should you decide to take Environmental Science 1302, well worth it, by the way, we are going to provide you with some very interesting thoughts and facts about humans and climate change. A case of murder. Is it or is it not? Intriguing, isn't it? So in 1994, a group of spelunkers, which are cave adventurers, were exploring a remote cavern named El Cedrone, deep in the northern forest of Spain. They made a startling discovery when they found a human jawbone, and this jawbone kind of changed everything. They got spooked. That's kind of hard to do for a spelunker, but these explorers immediately vacated the cave and went to inform the local authorities of what they had found in their discovery, by the way, which was the right action to take. According to ARPA, which is similar to PERPA, having to deal with archaeological resources, it's a, an act for preservation of archaeological finds, Anytime you find human remains, even on private property, you must turn that in immediately. It turned out that El Cedrone had served as a popular hideout for Republican guerrilla war fighters during the 1930s Spanish Civil War. And the authorities had initially assumed and theorized that the random jawbone had to belong to one of the unfortunate prisoners of war. Police detective crews traveled to the site to retrieve the jawbone and in the process discovered an additional scattered remains of over 10 people. What did we have here? A case of murder? Well, let's find out. Unsure of the victim's fates and the lacking evidence to draw conclusive results, using science, of course, the puzzled detective sent the various recovered items to a forensics lab to determine the ages and genders of the dead, as well as to conduct a full DNA analysis of the recovered bone pieces. That DNA analysis is kind of like a huge part of this story. Perplexed for six months, the forensics lab continuously studied these bones and eventually determined that the samples did not belong to any of the Spanish War victims. In fact, the specimens did not even belong to modern humans. Wrap your head around that. Did not belong to modern day humans. The bones belong to a 50,000 year old Neanderthal and the find was one of the greatest discoveries of the anthropological world of the century. 
this was a just enormous, huge find to find bones that were 50,000 years old in a place that we were not expecting to find it. And then what all we discovered and learned from them was just intriguing. Further analysis determined that the skeletons belonged to three adult males, one adult female, two unknown gendered adults. You might wonder, how would we know that? Well, because we didn't have all the right pieces of the bone structure, like the pelvis, to make that decision. Three adolescent males between the ages of 12 and 15, and ju two juveniles between the ages of 5 and 9, and one infant. Very sad, but this group of people was all together. What is up with this? A deeper analysis of the Neanderthal mitochondrial DNA supported a hypothesis that the 12 individuals were related when seven of the 12 individuals shared the exact same mitochondrial halotype. What does that mean? That means they shared the same maternal ancestry. Hmm. That should get your brain thinking. Four of the remaining 12 also shared the same mitochondrial DNA, meaning they also shared the same maternal ancestry. Other genetic information suggested that two of the males possessed red hair. You can determine what color hair an animal or an organism has with full DNA spectrum analysis. It is believed that a dozen Neanderthals had possibly suffered from genetic deformities from incestuous relationships. Hmm and had traveled together as part of the same nomadic family. If you ponder that for a minute, that may be part of the skin crawling, hair sticking up on the back of your neck, thought process of like, ew, we have to think back and roll the clock back to where the time frame was. You had to breed to keep your species alive. So let's be thinking about this as we are looking deeper into the story of a case of murder. It was obvious that these individuals had died at the same time. Big, big, big red flag. But despite all of the findings, the one thing that remained a mystery was the shared cause of these poor people's death. For almost two decades, researchers studied the cave and removed a whopping over 1,800 Neanderthal bone fragments and 400 stone tools from El Cedrone. Wow, these people lived there. This was their home. The mystery surrounding their deaths became internationally recognized and known as the Caveman Cold Case, like an unsolved mystery cold case. In 2010, researchers felt as though they had discovered sufficient forensic evidence to determine a likely cause of death. The cause? What could it possibly be? The Neanderthals had been slaughtered. It really was a case of murder. Their flesh sliced from their bones and eaten by rival Neanderthals. Now you're going, this is really getting icky. Well, it is an icky story to think about. The cause of the death is based on several key pieces of scientific evidence collected from the site, of which some of the animal bones show what the stone cuts look like on an animal bone. These same kind of bone cuts were found on human bones. So we find stone cuts on the human bones. The femurs were forcibly broken into two pieces on each of the adults, and the marrow was removed. Hmm. Their bones were still in good shape, indicating that they had been buried shortly after their deaths. Many stone knives, axes, and points were discovered near the bones, indicating that this is where those nomadic Neanderthals lived. Observe the cut marks on a Neanderthal's recovered jawbone that we have pointed to right here. That is not normal. That was after death. This was something that occurred to get meat off of the flesh of a bone. Who were these amazing humans that we have found in El Cedrone? What could have possibly happened to these ancient humans and led them, or the group that did consume them, to cannibalism? What type of environment did these ancient humans live in, and what happened to the Neanderthal species as a whole? What in the world does this have to do with environmental science? Climate change... So if you look to the picture there that we have showing of a reconstruction of one of the Neanderthals discovered at El Cedrone, these people were regular people, just like you and me, trying to survive. So let's dig a little deeper 
pun intended, on who were the Neanderthals. They are a subspecies of humans and they share 99.5 guaranteed test question, 99.5% to be precise, of our DNA. Chimpanzees share about 98. Now I want to hit that chimpanzee story a little bit more. You often hear people say we descended from chimpanzees. That is incorrect. They're our closest living relative. Or are they? Could some of you be Neanderthals? Let's find out. Neanderthals lived between 200,000 and 28,000 years ago across Europe, Asia Minor, and even Asia proper. They were short and stocky and thick with short lower arm and leg bones and a broad chest. And this chest was important to how these humans survived their time. Their primary ancestors left Africa around 65,000 years ago. So if you look at our little picture here, we have very, very happy Neanderthal. It is pronounced Neanderthal. Many times you'll hear people say it Neanderthal. Well, I want you to get it right. It's Neanderthal. Neanderthals generally lived in areas dominated by cold, if not very cold, climates that were too harsh for our modern Homo sapiens sapiens, which is a correct scientific name, by the way. Neanderthals are believed to be the first humans to live outside the temperate climate, so they had to adapt. Neanderthals' bodies were naturally inclined to conserve heat energy within their central core. That's part of being the short, stocky person, which this gave them great advantages for very cold climates, much more so than our modern ancestors. Hence, that's why we easily get cold. So Neanderthals were interesting. When you look at the body plan of a Neanderthal, here is a modern day human and here is the body plan of a Neanderthal. Now, most modern humans are much taller, but I'm wanting you to really look at the chest cavities, the cranium, notice the bow-leggedness, the long hands, the difference in the thumbs, and the difference in the feet leg and leg bones here. Very important and also bigger eye sockets, bigger nasal cavity, Lots of things unique about these organisms that make it important to differentiate between modern humans, even our ancient human ancestors that were Homo sapiens. So let's look at the Neanderthal height. An average male was five and a half feet tall and weighed 143 pounds. A female was five feet one inches tall and weighed approximately 115 pounds. It's believed generally that males and females possess very similar physical capabilities and near equal strength. Because of this, male and females and even children were likely part of the hunting team that hunted together in groups, unlike modern humans. Now take a look at this food, and if you're not like, ow, that's a lot of food, this is the amount of calories that... At minimum, a Neanderthal would have needed to consume in order to survive on a daily basis. It's a 4,000 calorie a day diet. Wouldn't you just love to be able to eat that much and burn that much in the same day without a whole bunch of exercise? Most Neanderthals had red hair and extremely pale skin because of their per preference for living in cold climates and a need for their bodies to produce calcium and vitamin D. Just as modern humans, especially if they live north of uh, the Arctic Circle, the average Neanderthal's met metabolism required an estimated 4,000 calories per day, roughly twice of what a modern human would be eating. Neanderthals were very powerful and compact with extremely strong muscles, part of the reason they had thicker bones than modern humans. Their muscles were three to four times stronger than modern humans, giving them a competitive edge with an Olympic power lifter. In other words, they're as strong as one of these guys over here. Wow. But you need to have a strong body frame to hold these muscles. And you would need to be effectively built to be able to withstand that kind of muscle power. Neanderthal skull were long and low, but their brains were slightly larger than our own with an expanded frontal lobe. I think that frontal lobe thing is kind of important. 
that's a strong indication that they have the ability to socialize and problem solve because this is the area of the brain where that problem solving occurs. Their large brain does not necessarily mean that they were more intelligent than modern humans, but just for argument's sake, maybe, just maybe. Expected intelligence is based around the ratio of the brain to the rest of the size of the body and the spinal cord, and their bodies were twice as hefty as their ancestors. When you look at a Neanderthal, notice the thicker vertebrae here and the larger nose socket, the bigger eyes. These people were built for a unique situation in terms of what they ate and the climate in which they lived. It is believed that Neanderthals were scavengers who often hunted with spears in close range to their prey because they were strong enough to fight them up close, like one-on-one -on -one battle. Unlike our puny ancestors who used projectile-type uh, weapons to uh, hunt, they were known for their specialized stone tools, which mostly held specific purposes for scraping flesh from bones, cutting flesh open, and for spearing prey. There is evidence that clusters of Neanderthals understood how to create and control fire. That's a huge plus, especially in a cold climate. The average life expectancy for both males and females is to believe to have been about 30 years old because of harsh life and living conditions. That means that I am much older than the life expectancy of a Neanderthal. That is extremely humbling to me. Most of you watching this video are probably getting in your prime towards old age in Neanderthal times perspective, life expectancy. Many scientists believe that Neanderthals traveled in small groups, less than 20, while our ancestors traveled in larger clusters, around 200 people. Recent developments show that Neanderthals possessed the same bones that we did to control a voice box. That means they may have been able to communicate. Their voices would have been high-pitched and somewhat garbled. A recent scientist who reconstructed the voice box of a Neanderthal generated this sound. I'll play it several times for you. He's saying the letter E. Kind of interesting, huh? The Neanderthals displayed a wide variety of actions when it came to treatment of the dead. Some scholars propose that Neanderthals may have been practicing human sacrifice or engaged in cannibalism, as mentioned in our earlier case study. Sometimes the dead were placed in trash pits. This is likely because the rest of the ground was frozen and they had no shovels to break up the permafrost. Remember permafrost from earlier in the semester are soils that are frozen year-round. One young Neanderthal skeleton was removed from under a large limestone rock covered in what appeared to be personalized engravings and markings. Other Neanderthal skeletons were recovered with items hypothesized to be significantly important to the dead. In other words, specifically left with that person for a reason. Examples included carved jewelry from animal bones or uniquely shaped rocks that were probably ones that were endeared to that particular human. There is evidence that Neanderthals may have practiced an animistic religion that worshiped nature and the elements of nature. Some famous paintings on the walls of European caves, like this one in Altamira Cave in Spain, have been dated to a period when it was likely that only Neanderthals dominated the region or area. It is important to realize that Neanderthals were a species of human, but they didn't necessarily practice a uniform culture. Think about it like this. Modern humans have many beliefs. They practice different religions. They have different daily practices, preferences, cultures, language, resources, appearances, etc. What would a new species say about us in 250,000 years? Could they draw extremely detailed conclusions about every modern human in the world if their only skeletal samples came from looking at one Texan and one New York person? The answer would be no. That is kind of how we have to draw conclusions on Neanderthals, because remember they were nomadic and they traveled in small clans. Look at how the widespread Neanderthals were uh, expanding throughout their range. 
Now, one thing I want to point out, the yellow marks their boundaries. Now, it's not that we had, couldn't or wouldn't ever find a Neanderthal out of this area, but this is the cluster of where majority of the bones have been found. And one thing I like to point out is how close in proximity they are to each other. This has to go back to the uh, way that the legs were built and how these humans had to survive. These were bow-legged humans. They were not built for long-distance walking, migration, or running, unlike modern humans who were. So naturally, these nomadic humans would have moved from place to place in search of food. They were looking for places that could help them survive, but they would not have been able to travel and migrate long distances. For a long time, modern humans believed that we were the only humans to ever live, the only species. This was a belief deeply rooted in religion, cultural, and social traditions, as well as most scientific findings of the time. Everything changed in 1856 when workers discovered part of a human skull in Neander Valley, Germany. And the picture you see here is from Neander Valley. They reported it to local authorities when they found this, these remains who determined that it was ancient but did not know what to make of it, so they showed it to some scientists. Smart. Go science, right? The skull was larger than others that the experts had seen, but still appeared to be human in origin. After an extensive evaluation, scientists formally announced the discovery of the first human fossil called the species Homo neanderthalensis after Neander Valley, where it was first discovered. Tragically, the quarry where it was found was destroyed, and this is a uh, a terrible thing because this was one of the most important sites that changed the history of understanding modern humans. So these are some of the main places where Neanderthals have been discovered around the world. And if you look at the thousands of years, this is the age, the El Cedrone, Neander Valley. You're looking at these various different places and notice that over here on the east side, you're going to see a little bit older. And as they're migrating west, it gets younger. That's an important element. What happened to the Neanderthals? Nobody really knows, but we have a lot of hypotheses out there. Originally, the first theorists gravitated towards an idea that a series of epic battles occurred between the various subspecies that determined which human was the most fit to survive, but that's not likely what happened. Instead, here's the most pragmatic theory. However, by the way, this is Wilma, if you're looking at the picture, and she is a Neanderthal woman named after Fred Flintstone's wife. Isn't that cute? So what happened to the Neanderthals? Global ice core records unanimously agree that from 30,000 years ago to 18,000 years ago, the Earth's climate vastly fluctuated for various reasons, which... Of most, we remain undocumented. In other words, we are not quite sure exactly how it happened. During that time of dramatic climate shift, the Neanderthals, anatomically equipped for a cold climate, not warm climates, experienced the same levels of warm, temperate weather that favored the development of modern humans. Strike one for them, actually. So uh, ice cores kind of give us a clue as to what's going on. As the average global regional temperatures rose, modern humans searched for new resources in the lands previously dominated by Neanderthals. As the climate would fluctuate, sometimes as frequently as decade to decade, that's pretty fast fluctuations there, the already limited resources in a cold climate became even more scarce as competition increased between modern humans and Neanderthals. So... Uh-huh. And you might be thinking, I wonder if they crossed paths ever, ever. The answer is, did they cross those paths ever? It's a definite yes. <laughs> Neanderthals suffered greatly because of their need for twice as many calories as modern humans. And various fossil records indicate that Neanderthals began to experience malnourishment shortly before their extinction. Just like with modern humans, Neanderthals likely only became hostile when there was a struggle for limited resources. Sound familiar to endangered species and uh, competitive species, invasive species? This is how it all ties together for the course. Some clusters of Neanderthals likely became more aggressive and more desperate for food as they had to share the resources with other human species. 
Perhaps this explains the cannibalism addressed in the case study because it also confirmed through carbon dating that the cannibalistic act occurred during a time that would correspond with the series of volatile climate shifts. Initially, most Neanderthals and modern humans probably lived their entire lives with little or no contact with each other. But as climate fluctuated and their shared need for resources increased, meetings would likely become more frequent. When the Neanderthal being adroit to hunting and modern humans requiring less energy while possessing a strong ability to adapt, sometimes the two may have teamed up. Smart people, right? One or two Neanderthals mixing and breeding with a small group of modern humans. How do we know this? Because DNA in modern humans has partial Neanderthal, depending on where you're from, of course. DNA records indicate that modern humans and Neanderthals begin to interbreed in and around Asia Minor, all the way through Asia and Western Europe. Today, every human whose ancestry originates from outside Africa has roughly 2% DNA from Neanderthals. However, every human being whose ancestry solely originates from Africa has absolutely zero Neanderthal DNA. It is also important to note that officially the Neanderthals die off at different times based on their geography. So it may, it's not like they all died off at exactly the same time. In Europe, a large volcano erupted near Naples, Italy that likely disturbed the ecosystems causing them to starve because of their migratory lifestyle and their need for lots and lots of calories. It is thought that modern humans could have even acted as an invasive species because modern humans required fewer calories than Neanderthals and used projectile weapons, plus being able to use trained dogs to assist in hunting. Kind of interesting that way back when people were using dogs to help with the hunting skills. Neanderthals have been documented to have once lived in present-day Mongolia, Israel, Germany, Britain, Spain, Portugal, Russia, all of these different places, and many more. The last known evidence of Neanderthal is at Gorman's Cave in Gibraltar, Spain, where a small group of Neanderthals built a fire from coal and made some stone tools. The artifacts collected from this cave reflect a diet of mussels, turtle shells, dolphin bones, seal bones, all with cut marks. Rabbit bones and wild asparagus identified from fossil pollen. So I'll share something about asparagus that some of you may not know. When I did my DNA testing for 23andMe, I uh, showed a, a special gene that uh, is likely to produce an odor when you eat asparagus in your urine. So that's what not that you really wanted to know that, but it's kind of an interesting fact. So if you've ever wondered if you ate asparagus and you're like, hmm, what's that? When uh, you've eaten and a few hours later it comes out the other way, you're like, oh, I just thought that was me. Actually, it's a gene. It's an interesting gene. It is important to understand that in the greater scheme of things, scientists know very little about our closest relatives. We need to know more. Almost every day, a new discovery is made about humans, some that are quite shocking, and we're going to look at a few of our examples and ancestors. The Denisovians. In 2010, the official discovery and recognition of another human species known as the Denisovians was announced in a series of research papers. This was a big deal. Scientists discovered an almost perfectly preserved finger finger and it had plenty of DNA that provided a near perfect genome map for a completely new species of human in Asia. The DNA assessments determined that the Denisovians were yet another subhuman species that lived in present-day Siberia who were also to believe to have been breeding with both Neanderthals and modern humans. So could we be part Denisovian as well? Just as with the Neanderthal, scientists believe climate change to be the culprit of the extinction of the Denisovians. As Denisovians interbred with Neanderthals and eventually modern humans, it is believed and hypothesized that the genetics were simply absorbed into modern human population of Far Eastern Asia. 
This is the way a lot of the species go extinct in the in geologic past, so it's not a surprise. This hypothesis originates from comparing genomes of modern humans living in far eastern Asia to ancient Denisovians. So if we compare DNA patterns for Denisovian DNA versus Neanderthal, I want you to notice that they're very, very heavy in Far East Asia. Uh, and European is not present or African in Denisovian. In Neanderthal, African is absent. We do see some Far East Asia, 2%, and then we see 2% European. So most people who are Caucasian have a high, high percentage of European, almost exclusive European background. Interestingly enough, when I did my 23andMe genome testing, I had a like tiny, tiny little percent that was sub-Saharan African. It was way cool. It was like almost a percent. The hobbits, Homo floresiensis, another human found only in the Indonesian of Flores. They live between 100,000 to 60,000 years ago and possess some stone tools, just like our other subhumans did. These were tiny little itty bitty people. Cute. They stood three feet, six inches tall on average. They had small brain cavities, large teeth, small chins, large feet, and small legs. They hunted small elephants, would have been uh, little bitty versions of mammoths, most likely, and large rodents, and they may have used fire. Homo heidelbergensis. These lived from 700,000 to 200,000 years ago, and they used fire and wooden spears. We know they built shelters because we see evidence of that in the archaeological record. Some believe these species was an ancestor to our own, while others believe it coexisted like the other subspecies we've mentioned thus far. How was the stature of size of their bodies in comparison to the ones that we've seen thus far? Males on average stood about 5 feet 9 inches tall and weighed 136 pounds, and females were 5 feet 2 inches tall and weighed about 112 pounds. How does this information really relate to environmental science today? Because it does. The simple, bold answer is climate change eradicates species. Slowly, dot, 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 by starving everything. Climate change is a major culprit of extinction, so we need to accept that even our modern-day species could be subject to climate change impacts. The important questions. The theory of climate change appears to serve as the most frequent and plausible explanation for why they were limited in resources in every case of human extinction. New discoveries indicate how Homo sapiens are also susceptible to background extinctions. Remember learning about extinction? Especially as our population continues to grow past the 7 billion mark. Too big, and it's getting bigger, and our resources are diminishing. Did rapid climate change cause our ancestors to become violent and cannibalistic because of lack of resources? What happened to the Neanderthal and Denisovians? How did the environment change to a point that they faced background extinctions? What should our species do to increase our sexual fitness since we cannot simply breed with another human species? This is something serious to think about. As we have mentioned throughout the semester, Sexual fitness is about being able to pass genes on and produce viable offspring that can also reproduce. So if you could have other subhumans to breed with, then you could create basically a new gene pool. If we don't have those options, eventually, especially if our birth rates go down around the world, this could be a serious problem if we were to have some kind of catastrophic climate change. So do you think we will become extinct via a mass or background extinction? How does a perfectly adapted species like the Neanderthal go extinct as a result of climate change? So let's move into science servings. That's always a happy moment, right? Sometimes graphic designers like to have online competitions to uh, see who can turn out the best celebrity as a Neanderthal. So, so here's Mr. Brad Pitt as a Neanderthal caveman. Cute, isn't it? Harrison Ford, and of course Tommy Lee Jones and our great Neanderthal 
environment. So Brad Turner and myself, who are the authors of your textbook for this class, decided to do 23andMe. He did it first and I did it about a year or two later. And he was so proud to be 2.8% Neanderthal. So I took mine and he was just guessing. He was like, you're going to come back low or you'll be really high. And when I came back at 3%, he was like, mm. He really wanted to win that, but I'm proud to say that I'm 3% Neanderthal, and I think Brad should be proud that he's 2.8 because the average human has 2%. So there's Brad on the left as a Neanderthal, and then there's me on the right as a Neanderthal in Yosemite. So it's kind of a fun thing just to look at and just to kind of go, okay, what do you have to do with your time? So as we conclude, I would like you to think that preservation is important for any species. Action will be taken to prevent the next disaster as soon as possible after it's occurred. Unfortunately, if a species of human goes extinct, we have no way to throw a life preserver out there to help them. So in the next two lectures, get ready because we're going to give you the real story on climate change. I look forward to seeing you in the next lecture. Bye.